Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Welcome elite achievers to another terrific episode of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Today, we are going to chat helpful, engaging marketing and how that differs from interruption marketing. This is huge. Let me tell you why. We hate interruptions, right? I mean, look at the explosion of DVRs, on-demand television, and podcasting. Why are they exploding? Because they eliminate unwanted interruptions. You don't have to deal with them. I got to the point where I prefer to record live sports and watch them later without all those interruptions. So with that intro, I am excited to introduce today's guest, a master of engaging marketing, Dan Moyle. Dan has a background in TV news business, so he understands interruption and brings a wealth of knowledge from writing to video production to multimedia content creation. His motto, I'd rather help someone reach 50 ideal customers rather than 5,000 passive viewers. And we're going to get into that a little bit because I'm interested in that motto. Dan is a believer in servant leadership and can be found behind the scenes at organizations like Talon's Out Honor Flight and Interview Valet. Welcome, Dan. How are you doing today? Hey, Jake. It's great to be here, man. I, I appreciate it. Every day's a blessing. So I'm I'm happy for today and I'm happy to be here with you, man. Well, it's great to get on the uh, podcast and to talk. One of the things I love about podcasting is the opportunity to meet new people that have different backgrounds and really come at things differently. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun talking about that. Before we do, what do we miss? Hobbies, family, personal life? Uh, let's see. What else? Um, I ride motorcycles. I have a Harley. I've been riding for about 25 years. Um, I've got a, a family, a, a blended family. So uh, post-divorce, you know, remarriage. So a daughter and a stepdaughter and everything that blended families entail. Um, I love to hang out with my family. I love to ride my motorcycle and I love to in, engage with people, you know, personally, professionally and everywhere. So I just I, I love people. Well, and you do a lot. I mean, you're, you've got a lot of background, a lot of experience. You're doing a lot now with Interview Valet and some of these things that you're involved in. When do you find time with a family and everything to get on that motorcycle and get out and go? <laughs> uh, it's, it's not always easy. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's nice that my, my wife will ride with me occasionally. She enjoys it, but she isn't real passionate. Uh, my oldest daughter is very passionate about it, so she'll ride with me. Um, my dad rides, so it's a family thing sometimes. You know, I'll, just, I'll, I'll be maybe cr- a little cranky or something, you know. Um, and my wife will say, hey, why don't you go ahead and text your dad and go ride? <laughs> so we, we find that time where we can. <laughs> Well, and as I've talked to other bike riders, you know, motorcycle riders, you know, there's a real community out there. There's this real sense of together family, if you will, when you get out there. And I think it's great that you've brought your, you know, your real family, traditional style family out on the bike with you. Yeah, it's really cool. You know, it's my, my, my dad got me started back when I was, you know, 15. Well, I mean, I rode when I was like one year old as well, but started riding at 15 and my dad rides, my mom rides with him. Um, my dad's siblings, several of them ride. A lot of our friends have become family to us because we all ride together. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a family affair for us. Um, you know, you won't find us at any outlaw clubs or, you know, riding bar to bar, that kind of thing. We ride to really enjoy the bike, the company, and just the, the nature around. I'm, I'm in Michigan. And so we have some amazing roads to ride in Southwest Michigan. So yeah. And you only get to ride them about two or three months a year. So you really get out and enjoy it. (laughs) That's what it feels like. Yeah. (laughs) I just a little bit. We live out here in Phoenix where the weather is perfect year round. And anybody who tells you it's too hot, doesn't know what they're talking about. (laughs) That sounds good. It's a dry heat. So there you go. That's right. It's like, (laughs) like being on the surface of the sun. That's right. (laughs) All right, Dan, we can talk all day about motorcycles and the difference between riding on the road and riding on the dirt and how much fun that is. But I got to talk to you about this difference between helpful and engaging marketing and interruptive or what you sometimes call sexy advertising, because I think it's so important. So why don't we jump into that? Yeah. You know, that whole sexy advertising thing started back when I was working for a mortgage company and I was the marketing guy. I started off with them as basically the blogger and the guy who did Twitter. Um, And I grew it to a department of seven of us. And we were responsible in 2016 for $75 million in closed loans directly that we could attribute from the website. So a a month's worth of revenue, basically. And so, um, you know, we 
So we really had fun using the whole inbound methodology there in this boring industry. And it started there for me because um, I was asked to talk about what it's like to do inbound marketing in a boring industry. And rather than be offended and say, oh, mortgages are boring, really? <laughs> I just kind of went with it and said, you know what? You're absolutely right. I'm, I'm not doing the, the the giant, you know, sexy ads that come out for beer or cars or motorcycles if we talk about Harleys, right? I don't have a product or a service that makes people, you know, really feel super engaged at that level, that, that you know, supermodels and whatever else you want to you use, right? Um, so instead of trying to break through the noise and shout louder than everybody else or interrupt more often, I instead decided to, uh, and, and the company Amerifirst decided to use the inbound and, and content marketing strategy of creating engaging content to help others. And the more you help, the more they'll come back, right? The more you build that trust rather than trying just to shout and create these, you know, super sexy ads as everybody wants to do, uh, viral marketing, all these things that everybody wants to just break through to a million views or whatever. I decided just to help as, as many as I could with the, the truth, easy to read, uh, you know, d helpful marketing. And that really worked for us very well. We had some, some great successes with that. So that's where that all started. And so what I think is really intriguing about this conversation that we're having is you took an industry that isn't typically, you know, an inbound industry or, you know, like you say, it's not sexy to talk about mortgages. So we can relate this. A lot of the listeners here, Dan, are small business owners or they're entrepreneurs and they're thinking to themselves, how does inbound marketing relate to me? How can I use it for myself and my business? And what you're showing is that there really is a way to do it. So you come into this business and you're a one man show, you're blogging and you're twittering. How do you go from those two activities to building a department of seven people? What were your first steps? So if I'm a, if I'm a real estate agent or if I'm a dentist or if I'm an entrepreneur and I want to start building my inbound credibility and my inbound uh, attention, how do I do that? Where do I start? I started with the very first idea of uh, they ask, we answer. And, 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 I, and I quote Marcus Sheridan, the sales line on that. But even before he wrote the book, before he was really speaking around the country about it, we started doing that at, at Amerifirst as well. About the same time he was doing it with his pool business, we were doing it with the mortgage business. Any, I mean, you think about getting a mortgage and buying a home. Anything that it's a huge process. Anything that those folks ask to the sales team, to the loan originators, I wanted to answer through our marketing. So for whoever it is, whether it's a dentist, whether it's a real estate agent, uh, whoever it is, Jake, right? It's it's any entrepreneur can look at their their service, their solution, and what the people they're helping are asking, and make sure you answer it. And and I started with blog articles, and then I started with video. Of course, coming from TV, I you know I knew enough video to be able to uh, um, conceptualize it, pre-produce it. You know, record it, produce it, edit it, be the host, do everything, and then put it up on YouTube and then use that in blog articles. Um, so it was a truly a, a one-person show, no doubt about it. But my, my first hire was a video marketing specialist. I actually hired a photojournalist from the TV station that I had left. I knew he wanted to make a change in his life and so forth. And, and I got a hold of him and said, look, you know, I, I want a photojournalist to, to help us to create a video production department basically within marketing. And that was my first hire. So, you know, my, on one hand, I started with just answering the questions in whatever format I could through blogging, through, through my own videos, uh, you know, simply made videos through, uh, Facebook posts, through tweets, whatever it was. Uh, and then from there to grow it, I went with a, a video marketing specialist as my first hire. And it just, it went from there. And even if you can't hire somebody, you know, you can try to find interns or freelancers, uh, folks who, you know, maybe instead of hiring an entire video agency, which could be very a, a very big budget for good reason, um, you could hire you could hire a little bit smaller and and find an, an intern to pay uh, who's just out of high school or just starting college, this kind of thing. So, so there was a real nugget of of inspiration in there that came out for me. And you said this: you said you started with identifying what people were asking before they were asking it. And you're right. I just bought a house three weeks ago. 
set up a new mortgage, tons of questions. I had more questions than I knew I had. I mean, as as I would get one answer, a new one would pop up. And so what you're saying is anybody can start, not just in the mortgage industry, but any industry that you're in, start with looking at what people are going to be asking. When they come to you, what information are they going to be seeking and provide that in a way that they understand? Now, I think part of what's happening and and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you look at some of these companies, these mortgage companies or other industries out there, they're answering questions, but they're not doing it in a way that we understand. They're doing it in a complex way. They're trying to give us facts and data and not enough storytelling and flavor, if that makes any sense. Is that what you're seeing? Is that what's happening? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, quite often they they try to answer the question with their, what they what they want to tell you rather than what you need to understand, right? So if you go start asking about, um, you know, how to buy a house with no down payment, they may start answering all these questions with jargon rather than real world speak about about what programs are available and how they work. And they just, they lay on a ton of jargon and and try to steer you rather than just answering your question, right? And and sometimes as a business, you can answer every single question with a completely, totally, here's everything that I want to give you, right? For instance, in the mortgage industry, it's really hard to answer the question, what's my interest rate? Okay, a lot of it depends, you know, there's so many answers that go into that, it depends on your credit score, on your down payment that you have, on, you know, the time of day, the markets, all these things. And so interest rates uh, are a little bit difficult to answer, but you can still answer that question in a very real world way, very honestly, and say, you know, it kind of depends and here's why. And and that's what we did. And yeah, I've certainly found that um, a lot of other, you know, mortgage companies were answering questions with just a ton of jargon and and not really giving people what they need. Um, they're just giving them what, what they want from a business. And I think that's something that, that entrepreneurs and business owners, you know, have to do well to keep in mind is that you think... We all think that we know what our customers want to hear and what we think they should hear. But really, if you just answer their questions honestly and authentically and openly, that's all they want, really. Well, and you opened the door for me because my next question was going to be this authenticity. And I've seen authenticity really grow in popularity and importance over the last couple of years. And I want to talk to that with you. How is authenticity playing a role in you know, identifying what our our customers and clients need and also having this, you know, inbound marketing where people are coming to us for answers. What role does authenticity play? I think it plays a huge role. I mean, it's, it, it's often in, in my little mind, it's, it's often difficult to really define authenticity, but you know it when you see it, you know, it's kind of like the X factor or whatever in, in a star. Yeah. They're a pretty good actor or actress, but you know, all of a sudden you see somebody who is charismatic and who, who, who has that it factor. Authenticity is kind of the same way. I mean, to me, I've seen businesses try to be authentic and they're just not. And it's like, you know, you're just, you're just trying to speak to the 20 year olds right now. And you're the 55 year old, you know, kind of weird parent, creepy, whatever. And it's just not working. Whereas if you speak to them as, as adults, you know, and don't try to be hip and don't try to be what you aren't, you know, if, if you are, you know, Morgan Stanley and you're this giant firm you're not going to try to be the next Snapchat star. But if you can uh, use what you have as knowledge and information and speak to them, to, to your potential clients in a very real world way and honest and open and transparent, that's authenticity to me. So, you know, authentic isn't trying to be hip. It's trying to be who you are. You're not going to be funny. You know, at AmeriFirst, our voice was um, helpful and, you know, it, uh, intelligent, but reachable. Right. And so it wasn't going to be sarcastic. It wasn't going to be super funny. That's very hard to do. It wasn't going to be snarky. Uh, we weren't going to be that hip millennial type mar- mortgage company, you know, to, to use a stereotype. We just wanted to help people. And that was our authentic voice. So the first step then is to know what your authentic voice is, to know who you are. And so I'm going to hit you with a hard question here because I want to talk about this a little bit more. And that is, you know, we've seen if we've gone to the MBA program, we've been taught how to market. If we watch TV or we watch, we look online, we see how other companies are marketing. And part of that has created within each of us 
this separate identity where we've kind of taken on, we think this is the way that we need to do it. And what we're hearing from you and what I'm seeing in the market is that we need to be more ourselves. But how do we do that after we've spent a lifetime kind of learning from others, seeing others, kind of burying what we feel inside? How do we get to that point where we understand ourselves, that authentic self? Uh, you know, a lot of deep thinking, <laughs> you know, that, that's something that, that you've got to kind of take stock of, of, of who you are at your core. And if you want to kind of expose that, um, you know, and, and really, I mean, as marketers, as business people, it, to me, it's, it's, it, you take that deep thinking and that philosophical side of things, but then you co- accompany that and marry that to testing. You know, if, if you think that your authentic voice is what you learned in your MBA program, then test that and see if that works with marketing, see if that resonates with others. Um, but, but we have to remember that those of us who, you know, have MBAs, uh, who have masters who do all these things, that may not be our client. And if it is, that's great. And you have a great connection with them and no problem. But, you know, especially for like, let's going back to the mortgage company, a lot of our clients were, you know, educated and intelligent, but they're not that far out of college, probably a bachelor's or they're, relatively fresh out of high school. They're first time home buyers who are thinking about this whole thing and they want to rent and whatever. And so they may not necessarily be the, um, very well educated master's degree. So to, so to speak folks, we had to speak to them on their level. Right. And, and for us, it was a very Midwest, uh, company. And so you think about that Midwestern voice, it's not necessarily going to be your city, uh, your urban areas of like walkability and sustainability and that kind of stuff. It's going to be more about buying your home with some land or you're talking about your neighbors rather than your tenants or this kind of thing. Um, so it's just understanding your buyer persona and finding your authentic voice in relation to that buyer persona. And so there's a couple of steps that you mentioned there. One is understanding your buyer. And I think that's absolutely vital. The other and and part of the question is, how do we understand ourselves? And I think what you're saying is, and you started with this, the X factor, when you see like an actor or Hollywood star that has, you just look at them, you go, they have something, they have it. And they make it look easy as they go about their role and their opportunity, they make it look easy. And I think when we start to discover what our true authentic self is, we make it look easy. It feels easy to us. So if you're writing blog articles or if you're having conversations with clients and it feels forced or it feels uncomfortable, then you may want to look at that and make a shift. The other thing you said, the third step then would be to test and to make sure that the direction you're heading is right. And you know, the market will tell you, I mean, the market's pretty honest. You want, you want authentic real life, you know, authenticity coming back to you. The market will give it to you. So go ahead and test. Okay. I want to talk about this now. Storytelling. So I'm a huge storyteller. You could probably tell uh, on the podcast. I love to tell stories. I love to share stories, but I want to talk to you about being a storyteller and why it's important and how we can become better storytellers. You know, being a storyteller, I think, and in, in especially in this day and age, but for until from, from the beginning of time until now, is so important because we want to hear stories. We as, as humans connect over stories. Uh, you know, marketing is really just having the right conversation with the right buyer at the right time and, and having, again, authentic. I mean, to keep going back to that, but just having that conversation. That's what it really boils down to. And that conversation is around a story. You know, it used to be if you if you were a, an auto mechanic in a small town, you know, 50 years ago, there there wasn't a way to reach all of your state or all of the country or all of the world. You just had those uh, – you would talk story with your neighbors and they would tell the, your story to their friends who needed help or whatever it was, right? So you, you just talked story with people. You had those relationships. It was all based on that. And so I think – Using storytelling to create relationships is something that's just naturally in us. So it just kind of makes sense. That's what we want. And and certainly it's not new. I mean, you look back at, you know, content marketing really started back in the 1800s when John Deere created their, uh, the Furrows magazine, right? It wasn't about selling tractors back then. It was just telling the stories of farmers and it created this relationship and this endearing quality to John Deere and, and it worked. And that, I mean, that's back in the 1800s, the late 1800s. This isn't new. <laughs> so, but now that we have this, these new platforms, it becomes that much more amplified. So we can tell our story through Twitter, through Snapchat, uh, through YouTube, you know, through blogging, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I just, I really feel like storytelling 
is is very important to make that connection, make that relationship deeper, to develop a relationship, to begin a relationship, to take it to the next level, whatever you want to talk about when it comes to that relationship with your buyer, storytelling gets you there. And and it's not just telling your story. Hey, my company does this and we do that. And blah, blah. It's telling your story through your customer and making them the hero of that story. So how do we become better storytellers? If we're convinced that we need to tell stories, but we're not very good at it, or we don't know what our story is, we don't know what we want to tell, how do we com- become better at this? Especially when you start throwing out these different platforms, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, something new that's going to come along tomorrow. You know, as a storyteller, as a writer, I want to say hire one, <laughs> but, but that's not always possible. Uh, study the craft a little bit, you know, figure out what storytellers you really follow. If there's a company or, or a person on Twitter or somebody that you really respect as a storyteller, as a, as a business, maybe figure out how, how it is that they're doing what they're doing, you know, study them a little bit, read their story or listen to it, uh, and, and try, you know, emulation is where a lot of us begin. You know, when I first started writing, I was, of course I was, you know, a young teenager, uh, and I was reading a lot of Stephen King. So what did I do? I emulated Stephen King. I even wrote an exact story the way he did one, but with different names, basically. So we start there, um, and, and maybe don't publish that on Twitter. You know, <laughs> if you're going to copy somebody, don't publish that live. Always a good idea, <laughs> right? But at least, you know, at least you could start there and understand story a little bit, and start very simply. If the, a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, make sure that any story you're telling, whether it's a blog article or a Facebook post, has a a point, and then a beginning, a middle, and an end. It could be very simple. It can be very short, but at least it's there. And and then once you begin to feel that grow a little bit, then go deeper, you know, and maybe if you can hire somebody, great. If not, at least start to talk with other storytellers, other writers, um, marketers, other content folks. And just, you know, I, I surround myself with a lot of really good writers and smart people and and other marketing folks. And I just learn from them a ton. And one of the things that I recommend is just doing it. Just go out and try. I always keep what I call a story bank. So I have a spreadsheet where every time a story or an example or something I hear comes across my table, I throw it into this story bank so that when I need to tell a story, write a blog post or do something, I can just go right to it, pull it out and start from there. Now, one of the things I could hear the listeners saying, Dan, is Okay, you've talked about Twitter, you've talked about Snapchat. There are so many channels out there. I'm overwhelmed because each channel has a different storytelling process. I mean, do I have 140 characters? Am I going to be on video? Maybe I don't want to be on video. How do we hone in on what works for us or do we need to be everywhere? Yeah, I usually get this question all the time from real estate agents as as a marketer for a mortgage company, we wanted to connect with realtors and real estate agents. And when I did those presentations, that was always one of their biggest questions. And my, my answer very simply is, uh, no, you don't have to be everywhere. You can't be everywhere. You don't have the time or the attention and you just don't need to be everywhere. Um, but if you're going to be somewhere, be there. So for instance, uh, if, if you're, you know, if you're a Facebook user and you're really good at Facebook and you enjoy it and you spend time there, but you go open up a Twitter account, and then you aren't there, quote unquote, if you don't have it on your phone so you can get push notifications, that's a lot like opening up a store uh, and telling everybody that you're open from nine until five and you're never there and you never answer the phone. If you're going to be on a social media platform, uh, be there. Uh, but with that said, you know, I don't think you have to be everywhere. Figure out where your ideal customers are and try to be there. And that's why when I talk about buyers, it's not just buyers, it's buyer persona, right? It's demographics, it's behaviors, it's psychographics, it's a narrative uh, of that, who that person is. And I, and I took that from my, my training with uh, the company HubSpot. We used HubSpot uh, for our marketing back at Amerifirst and went through a ton of training with them, loved that company. And they talked about buyer personas a ton. And you actually write out, you know, buyer Bob and talk about buyer Bob. You know, you talk about listener Luann and who she is and what she does and where she finds her her information, where she spends her time on social media, if any, these kinds of things. You know, your your business may not have any buyers on Twitter at all. And if you're there, you're basically just shouting into a, a cavernous vacuum and who cares, right? So um so yeah, you don't have to be everywhere. Figure out where your buyers most likely are, spend a little time there, test it, just like you said, Jake. Just do it, just try it. And if you get a little bit of uh, of of mileage out of it, great, do it. And if not, 
shut her down and move on. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think we have now come full circle in this podcast because we started out saying we got to know who our buyer, who our client, who our customer is and play to them. And then we circle all the way back around and we say, look, if you want to be good at marketing, whether it's inbound, whether it's the the interruption style marketing, whether it's going to be on Twitter or any of these other thousand channels that are out there, the reality is the best thing you can do, the place you can start is to know your customer and start there. So great discussion, Dan. Uh, As we wrap towards the end now of the podcast, a couple of other things I wanted to talk about. I love mentoring. I love mentorship. I love working one-on-one with a coach or working in a small group. And I want to get your feedback and, and get your insights on how you can help others reach their potential or someone who's had an impact in your life. You know, I, I was thinking about this after listening to some of your your other shows. Uh, helping others reach their full potential really gets to when when you are mentoring them and when it's purposeful, you have to trust them, delegate to them, and let it go. But then follow up with them and give feedback. Right? You've you've got to trust them to do what they're going to do as you're talking to them and helping them and mentoring them, whether it's an intern or whatever. You've you've just got to trust that they're going to do what you need them to do. You, you mentor through trust and and following up with them and being deliberate I, I think um and as far as someone who has an impact i mean at my at my last job right, right now i'm with a company called interview valet and tom is amazing before interview valet uh, i worked for amera first and sandra my former boss was was a huge mentor to me she believed in me from the beginning she trusted me she delegated things to me she willingly gave me the tools that i needed um but then she also kept me in check you know, in a very honest way, you know, hey, this this didn't work. I'm disappointed that that happened. What are we going to do to make it better? Right. Uh, she was a, a big influence on me over the last f- quite a few years now. Um, and, and I, and I look back, she was definitely mentoring me and coaching me. And and it was a, a great experience. So. And Dan, you mentioned Tom over at Interview Valet. While not an official formal sponsor of this podcast, a lot of the credit needs to go to Tom, who's a past guest, and Interview Valet, because many of the guests that we've had on this show have come through that company. They do a ter- terrific job. We just really enjoy working with them, Tom and Aaron and the whole group over there. That's cool. I'm glad to hear that. I, yeah, I joined Tom uh, not quite three months ago now, um, as of as of our recording date. It's well, it'll be three months here in a couple of days. Anyway, um, I love what I do, love what we do. I love the fact that we connect. Uh, and he's, you know, Tom's a great mentor too. He is very open and honest and is a servant leader. I think that's a big thing in mentoring. You have to you have to kind of be a servant leader in order to mentor others and take them, you know, into your world. And talk about a man who gives without any expectation of return. Dan, as we wrap up this episode of the Modern Leadership Podcast, there's a section that I love. It's called Learning from Leaders. It's just five to six rapid fire questions to put a little personal in this business discussion that we've been having. I want to ask you a few questions. Are you ready for the Learning from Leaders section? Bring it on. All right. How about the book currently on your Kindle or bedside table? Uh, I'm currently reading The 12 Week Year from Brian Moran and Michael Lennington. The 12 Week Year. Sounds like the four hour work day. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. It's it's an amazing business and personal book that, that gets you to set realistic goals and look at uh, each twelve weeks as if it were basically a year and you really get a lot done and, and you do it purposefully and realistically. I love it. I love the idea of setting these time boundaries that make you focus and work towards a goal as as opposed to just saying, Well, I'll get it done someday. A, a year's too long. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You you look at a year and you say, okay, I'm going to lose, you know, 40 pounds this year. And then by summer, you're thinking, okay, I haven't lost any. And summer's really hard because there's a lot of picnics and stuff. But, you know, I'll probably run some. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, it's November holidays. You've actually gained weight. So it's like, no, let's let's start every 12 weeks. Yeah, it's really cool. Intentional. I love it. Okay. Best movie ever made. Best movie ever made. My favorite is The Crow with Brandon Lee. How about your leadership superpower? Uh, Empathy. Ooh, empathy, very important. What is empathy? Uh, being able to see the world from another another's point of view, I feel like. Yeah, and I think it's more than just seeing the other person, right? It's it's experiencing, it's really seeing it from their point of view, not just having sympathy for them, but really recognizing the, what they're going through. And I think in our day and age, we had a conversation through this podcast on uh, authenticity. I think authenticity and empathy really need to go hand in hand. They really support each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right. How about a motivational quote, philosophy, or mantra? Uh, I'm a faith guy. Uh, I'm, I'm a believer. So it's a, it's actually a Bible verse out of Matthew 20. And it's, uh, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And so that that mantra for me is all about service and serving others. And I'm not going to sit back and let and, and and demand people serve me. And what do you do for me? when I Whenever I network, whenever I work, whatever I do, I want to serve others. And one of my favorite mentors, Zig Ziglar, you can have everything you want in life if you just help enough other people get what they want. And that's really servant going out there and, and helping. If you could leave just one leadership trait to your kids or the next generation, what would it be? I want to leave the trait of confidence in themselves to be able to lead through service. It, it, I run into far too many people who think that service means subservient and they don't have the confidence in themselves to say, you know what, I can serve others and that's actual leadership. And I just want to leave that trait of confidence in, in my kids. So valuable, and it is one of the five leadership superpowers that the listeners can get if they go to jkcarlson.com and take the free leadership superpower assessment. Find out what leadership superpower they lead from, confidence being one of them. All right, last question. How about best business book ever written? Best business book ever written. Uh, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek, so I think leaders eat last. And that was the May... 2017 book club, Modern Leadership Book Club book. We deep dove into it. Terrific book. Couldn't agree with you more on that one. Dan, thank you for coming on the Modern Leadership Podcast. You have so much knowledge about being this inbound evangelist and working on inbound marketing. Before I let you go, do you have any last minute advice or last bit of advice? And then how can we reach out and get in touch with you, find out more about what you're up to? Yeah, you bet, Jake. Uh, uh, any last thought kind of comes down to the mentoring that we talked about. I think it's important to find someone who's further along than you are and learn from them. And then the key is to reach back and teach others to do the same thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. As far as reaching me, I mean, uh, if you go to interviewvalet.com forward slash ML for modern leadership, your listeners can check me out there. Um, connect with me, download a, uh, a video marketing re- report that I created just to share a PDF. Um, they can, you know, it's not, it may, may not be the inbound thing, but it's, it's video. So it's really fun. Um, but they can also download an excerpt from my book that talks about uh, being an inbound marketer from the journalism world. So we didn't have a chance to talk about your book, but we will link all of that up on the show notes. Dan, thank you again for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Jake. It was a pleasure. And I look forward to hearing many more. All right. What a great interview with Dan. It's such a pleasure to sit down and talk with people who bring a different perspective, a different background. And I couldn't agree with him more. This interruption marketing needs to stop. We need to go in this direction of helpful and being out there to serve this servant leadership type of deal. A couple of the key points that I wanted to bring out for this episode. I love the discussion about identifying what people are asking before they're asking. You know, the best way to look like a professional, the best way to look like we know what we're doing is to go out there and figure out what people are going to be asking you so that you're ready with a response. So that when somebody says, hey, how do I or can you, it's an immediate answer. It's right on the tip of your tongue because you anticipated their needs. No better way to show that you care, that you're thinking about them, that you can help them than by being prepared to answer their question. The other thing we talked about was authenticity. Authenticity is the X factor. And I love the analogy of looking at a Hollywood actor and you say, look, this guy or gal, they just have something that's different. You can't put your finger on it. You could just see it. It's there. And that's because they're acting authentic. And how about us in our business? Do we have that X factor? Do we look like it's coming easy to us that we're moving in the right direction? That is the X factor authenticity. And then finally, marketing is really just the right conversation with the right person at the right time. If you want to be a good marketer, if you want to bring in business, more business than you can handle, it's all about telling the right story to the right person at the right time. And once they hear it, relate to it, feel your authenticity. Boy, I tell you, you won't be able to slow them down. You won't be able to stop the business from coming in. Now, everything we talked about, as you know, can be found on the show notes for this episode, including how to connect with Dan. And all of that is over on the website, jakecarlson.com slash ml34. And as a reminder, weekly, every Thursday, 
Join us for a free leadership and influence webinar. Get the details, sign up, reserve your seat, jakeacarlson.com slash webinar. Until next week, have a great day. Make a terrific life. Stop interrupting and start serving. Oh, and stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Bye.